today we're going to be discussing an interesting bit of aero technology that never really made its way that far out of Formula SAE, largely due to regulating bodies banning it, even though it's quite an interesting aerodynamics tech. And what it's called is unsprung aero, and it's important here to make the distinction between regular sprung aero and unsprung aero. Basically, in our regular car, let's say we have our aerodynamic devices of our rear wing and our front splitter. Now, conventionally, we would connect the rear wing to our boot or our chassis or something like that, and the front splitter will go into the front chassis frame. Now, compared to an unsprung aero car, what we do there is we pass the loads from the wing directly down to the outer suspension there, and we'll tie the loads from this splitter back to a rocker, which will load the front suspension there. Now, what does this mean? Two things. Well, one, we're going to see the splitter and the wing stay stationary, well, stationary as far as deflection allows, with respect to the wheel and tire assembly, as opposed to in the conventional case, where they stay stationary to the body assembly. Now, what does this mean? This means that let's say this tire bumps up, so we get a bit of bump there, it means this wing will bump up with it, even if the body stays flat. Or perhaps more importantly, let's say the body starts to roll, it means that the wing or the splitter, or if you decide to mount your entire under tray on it, it will stay flat while the body of the car moves over the top. So straight away we can see the benefits there of reducing our pitch and roll sensitivity by allowing basically a constant ground clearance with all of our components that are unsprung. But the benefits go much further than that. If we consider the equation for downforce, we can see that force equals a half of air density times the velocity squared times the area times coefficient of lift. Now, this is all constant, so constant there, constant there, constant there. So essentially, we've got force is proportional to velocity squared. Now, this is a little bit of a problem because when you design your springing rates and stuff like that on your car, you set up your springs for a given basic force. Um, as your speed increases, if the force, the downforce is increasing on your car, you've got two things happening. One, you'll get an increased uh, loading down from the downforce itself, and two, you'll see increased g-forces in corners. Now, there's not too much we can do about the increased g-forces in corners, because that's just a function of downforce. As we drive faster, we can corner harder. So we can't do too much about that. But by moving the loads out of the shocks, because if you think about it, here's our spring and damper combo here, there's our spring and damper combo there, very poorly drawn in both, so a basic coilover. Um, and currently, for the force to get from here to the tire, to the ground, it has to pass up and then through there, which compresses the springs. Now, depending on if you have position sensitive damping or not, this can move you to a different point on the damping travel. It also means that as your downforce is increasing, if you have a heap of downforce and relatively soft springs, you're going to start bottoming out the car really hard. Whereas if we run unsprung, we can actually see that we have our spring and dampers and they are never affected by the actual downwards force. They're affected by the, the G forces on the body and stuff like that, but the downwards force from the aerodynamic components passes straight to the wheels without going through them. And this means that we aren't going to risk bottoming our suspensions. We don't need to run tricky setups like nonlinear springs or um, third helper dampers and stuff like that. And so as a result, we can end up with a softer suspension setup. And the advantage of that is that means we can maximize our mechanical grip. So at lower speeds, we can get much more grip um, without compromising the aero grip at the higher speeds. Whereas currently, if you have an aero car, you have to run your springing much stiffer than you actually want it to be just to make sure that you hold a relatively consistent ride height on these and you're not bottoming out the whole car. But of course, unsprung aero isn't without its issues. Now, obviously, it's been banned in most forms of racing, so I'm not going to go into that, but there's a few other little bits and pieces. One is the difficulty of mounting. Something like these single seaters, we currently mount sprung like that, and unsprung is just done as push rods and bell crank rockets. Now that's easy enough when you've got a front wing and a rear wing, pretty simple to do. In a more touring car body though, 
I've drawn this really simply. Uh, I haven't included the fact that there's a whole bunch of chassis here that we somehow have to pass rods through to get it out to the suspension. And with the front, we actually have the additional complications of you've got a bumper and stuff like that there, that if this is moving around with respect to the body all the time, you'll get in contact there. Either that, or you have to have an air gap, or you have to have a flexible seal, something like that. It's actually quite difficult to get it working. It's much simpler to just bolt it to the chassis, call it a day. Now, the other big problem with it is that it increases your unsprung mass. Now, as far as unsprung mass goes, you want as low an unsprung mass as possible because it improves your general handling characteristics because it's much easier to control a lighter unsprung mass outboard region. Let's say your rear wing weighs 10 kilos and your front splitter weighs another 10 kilos. You just added 10 kilos of unsprung mass to the front and another 10 to the rear, so five per corner. Um, five kilos of unsprung mass is quite a lot in terms of uprights, control arm, stuff like that. And really, it, it's not ideal from that aspect. So you're gonna lose mechanical grip there. You'll get it back from having the softer springs, but it's not perfect, if you know what I mean. Finally, there's the cost and complexity of running a system like this, and often it's, it's just too much effort for people to do, because most of the series in which you could actually use this in, the more unrestricted series, are mainly home-built style cars, and people building home builds are just trying to struggle to get together something at all, let alone something of this level of complexity. This is especially compounded by the fact that, say, the front splitter has to have minimal compliance for the suspension for this entire setup to work properly, and you have to get really creative with how your bell cranks get back to there because this loads out here and you're trying to pass it to there, but still keep it vertical. So you can kind of start to see where the difficulty lies. Well, thanks for watching. If you liked this video, don't forget to check out my other videos and subscribe to my channel for more. And hopefully I'll see you next time.